Hi, in this video we will be discussing a few multiple choice questions in biochemistry uh, from the cumulative test 2. So it's better if you have a note simultaneously so that whenever I give you some important points you can just note them down, right? So we will start with the first question. I hope it's clear on the screen. Yeah. First question, the process of transfer of information from RNA to proteins is called options mutation translation transcription and conjugation so it's a direct question so translation is a process of transfer of information from rna to proteins right that's called as translation we will discuss other terms mutation we have even a transcription and conjugation so mutation it's nothing but permanent alteration of a nucleotide sequence of the genome of a particular individual or any living organism so that's mutation whereas transcription it's a process in which a gene's dna sequence is copied to make an rna molecule that is transfer of information from dna to RNA through RNA polymerase. So the RNA polymerase is the main transcription enzyme, right? And coming to conjugation. So conjugation, we have different meanings based on the subject we are discussing. For example, in case of a microbiology conjugation, it refers to transfer of genetic material between bacterial cells by direct cell to cell contact. Whereas in case of biochemistry, uh, when discussing drug metabolism, especially about transformation, we have two phases like phase one and phase two. So phase one reactions include oxidation, reduction as well as hydrolytic reactions. Whereas phase two includes covalent detachment of a small polar endogenous molecules such as glucuronic acid, sulfates or glycine. Seen. So ultimately these phase 1 and phase 2 reactions are, uh, are being performed within the liver in order to transfer or convert hydrophobic compounds into hydrophilic compounds so that they can be excreted through kidneys, right? So that's conjugation especially in biochemistry. So conjugation here in specific in biochemistry refers to phase 2 reactions where there is covalent attachment of small polar endogenous molecules such as glucuronic acid, sulfates or glycines to form water soluble compounds. So this we call it as a conjugation reaction. Right? So these are some of the terms pertaining to this question and the answer to this question I think it's clear. The process of transfer of information from RNA to proteins is called as translation right now let's move on to the next question the amino acid which is used in estimation of collagen so basically collagens are highly abundant mammalian proteins that contain a very high content of hydroxylated amino acids such as hydroxyproline so by estimating the amount of hydroxyproline we can estimate the amount of collagen because the major constituent of collagen is hydroxyproline right so the option here is a now moving on to the third question, yeah, the primary role of chaperones is to help so protein synthesis, protein degradation, protein denaturation and protein folding. So basically chaperones they are considered as heat shock proteins that facilitate and favor interactions on polypeptide surfaces to give specific conformation of a protein. So they basically give the protein a particular form and shape that we call it as conformation. It's CON, FOR, MATION, right? So chaperones are broadly divided into two types. Like we have heat shock protein 70 and chaperonin system. So basically they help in folding of proteins, right? So protein folding is done by these chaperones. That's the primary role of chaperones. And also remember that the failure of this folding or the failure of chaperone proteins can lead to improper folding of proteins which further leads to rapid degradation of proteins as in case of cystic fibrosis. And also misfolded proteins which are called as prions can get accumulated in cells and they can cause certain neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's disease. Right. So these are some of the important points pertaining to chaperones. So the primary role of chaperones is to help in protein folding right yeah now let's move on to the next question all are true about glutathione except it's a tripeptide it converts hemoglobin to methemoglobin it conjugates xenobiotics and option D it scavenges free radicals and superoxidation so first let's discuss some of the functions of glutathione so glutathione it's basically 
a tripeptide conjugating agent as we discussed previously conjugation so it helps in conjugation phase 2 reactions and several xenobiotics like foreign drugs or foreign substances undergo detoxification by conjugation with glutathione right and also this glutathione protects the integrity of RT RBC membrane, red blood cell membrane and also protects hemoglobin from getting oxidized by agents such as hydrogen peroxide, right? So these are some of the important functions pertaining to glutathione. So based on that, we'll go through the options now. So all are true about glutathione except it's a tripeptide, it's true. It converts hemoglobin to methemoglobin, it's false. In fact, it prevents formation of methemoglobin, right? So option B is the appropriate answer here. And option C, it conjugates xenobiotics, true. And option D, it scavenges free radicals and superoxidants, true. So all the options except B are true in case of glutathione. Now moving on to the next question. Which of the is a multi-enzyme complex? So we have options pyruvate dehydrogenase, alpha keto uh, ketoglutarate dehydrogenase succinate dehydrogenase and then enolase so basically a multi enzyme complex is nothing but it's basically it contains a combination of different enzymes for example in case of pyruvate dehydrogenase let me just show you the structure so it contains a combination of two or three active enzymes so as you can see, this is a structure of a pyruvate dehydrogenase, a multi-enzyme complex which contains three subunits. The first subunit on the top, it's transacetylase, it's a trimer. And the middle one, it is dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase, which is a dimer. And the final one is pyruvate decarboxylase. So it's a combination of three different enzymes or subunits. So it can be considered as a multi-enzyme complex, right? And similarly, even alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase, even that's a multi-enzyme complex right so of the given options option A and option B are the right answers so both pyruvate dehydrogenase and alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase are multi-enzyme complexes right now let's move on to the next question which of the following is a phospholipid so we have options glycosin sphingomyelin prostaglandin and oleic acid so let's look at this phospholipid, the basic structure of a phospholipid. So these are nothing but class of lipids that form the major components of a cell membranes. They can form lipid bilayers because of their amphiphilic characteristic, right? They are both hydrophilic as well as hydrophobic. The structure of phospholipid molecule, as you can see, it contains two tails two hydrophobic fatty acid tails and a hydrophobic head consisting of a phosphate group which is blue in color right so the components the two components are joined together by a glycerol molecule which is in yellow so this is a basic structure of a phospholipid and the example of phospholipid in the given options is sphingomyelin and in the options here we also have glycosin prostaglandin and oleic acid let's look at the other options also briefly so glycosin it's a multi-branched polysaccharide of glucose that serves as a form of energy storage in humans animals as well as other uh, eukaryotes such as fungi and we have another option here right option c prostaglandin prostaglandins are lipid autocoids derived from arachidoic acid so based on their inhibition we have various NSAIDs, right cox uh, selective inhibitors non-selective inhibitors etc and then we have another option oleic acid which is a fatty acid that occurs naturally in various animal vegetable fats as well as oil so it's a basically a fatty acid so of the given options uh, which of the following is a phospholipid so option b is the appropriate answer so apologies for the spelling mistake it is pingomyelin lin right okay now let's move on to the next question the product of oxidation of orch and fatty acids is so it's a direct question the product of oxidation of orch and fatty acids is propionyl 1 coa so this is a basic structure of propionyl coa right so fatty acids with odd number of carbon atoms are relatively rare in mammals but common in plants and marine organisms. These odd chain fatty acids are oxidized in the same way as the even chain fatty acids until the formation of propionyl CoA. This propionyl CoA is converted to succinyl CoA which then enters into the citric acid cycle for further metabolism, right? So when odd chain fatty acids are oxidized or when they are metabolized, the product which is obtained is propionyl 1 coa option c is the appropriate answer here right now let's move on to the next question fatty acids help in synthesis of all except so we have glucose cholesterol ketone bodies and fat 
So of the given options, so glucose can be formed from fatty acids through gluconeogenesis as you all know and cholesterol it's not synthesized from fatty acids as such cholesterol we have natural sources or even uh, it is it is it can be synthesized within the body through this hmg coa right so we have that uh, pathway where we have hmg coa hmg coa reductase uh, rate limiting enzyme etc right so so of the given options fatty acids help in synthesis of all except so cholesterol is the appropriate answer here even ketone bodies can be synthesized from fatty acids in case of starvation uncontrolled diabetes mellitus etc right and of course fatty acids through lipogenesis there can be formation of a fat right so all the options so can be synthesized using fatty acids except cholesterol right so option b is the appropriate answer here and coming to the next question berry berry is caused due to deficiency of so it's a straightforward question we have thiamine pyridoxine ascorbic acid and riboflavin so berry berry is most commonly seen in people consuming polished rice where all the outer coating is removed as a result there will be deficiency of thiamine vitamin b1 right 80 percent of thiamine is lost as a result of this polishing so option a is appropriate answer here right and also just note down the recommended dietary allowances of this vitamin b1 in various age groups in case of infants between 0 to 6 months the recommended dietary allowance of thiamine per day is usually just remember this in case of adults it's 1 to 2 milligrams of thiamine per day in case of infants 6 to i mean 0 to 6 months it's 0.2 milligrams infants 7 to 12 months it's again 0.3 milligrams just note down these values right and children 1 to 3 years it's 0.5 milligrams every day children 4 to 8 years it's 0.6 milligrams and men 14 years and older it's 1.2 milligrams girls 9 to 13 years it's 0.9 milligrams women it's uh, between 14 to 18 years it is 1 milligram women over 18 years 1.1 milligram and pregnant women the requirement would be obviously greater 1.4 milligram and breastfeeding women it's highest 1.5 milligram as a dietary supplement in case of adults on an average one to two milligrams of thiamine per day is commonly used just keep that in mind right now moving on to the next question the amino acid from which niacin synthesized is i mean uh, in the options we have tyrosine tryptophan threonine and histidine just have a look at this flow chart or schematic uh, representation of formation of niacin right so niacin it's nothing but vitamin b3 or nicotinic acid deficiency as you know it leads to pellagra so the amino acid as you can see here you have tryptophan top left from there through a cycle of uh, reactions it's uh, we can see formation of niacin here right so actually this illustration represents formation of melatonin as well as niacin so tryptophan is the mother molecule so tryptophan is the amino acid which is essential for the synthesis of niacin which is also called as vitamin b3 or nicotinic acid right hope it's clear